welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. You have me and the fabulous Christopher. Christopher, who have we got on? Evening, Alina. I am pleased to tell you that we have a very interesting subject tonight. And we have a returning guest, uh, Richard Sugg, who is a historian, previously a lecturer and author of 13 books, including Real Vampires, Mummies, Cannibals and Vampires, and is here to talk to us today about his newest project, The History of Disgust. So we're about to get absolutely filthy. Richard, welcome to welcome back to History Hack. How Many thanks. Doing? Great to be back. Thank you. I love how you said it was interesting. I was expecting you to say we're going to have a disgusting subject for you today. Pretty much. I was trying to be funny. It didn't really work, did it? More so than my jokes. But right, should we should we jump straight in with some of the greatest disgusting sentences? Let's go. So as part of the book, you're going to explain some of the entomology of some great sentences that we use all the time, such as wrong end of the stick. Yeah, it's thought this one's supposed to go way back to the Romans, who were relatively fastidious as to the word they would have used to express. Uh, disgust and the phrase is supposed to come from Roman toilets where you'd have uh, a sponge on a stick to clean yourself uh, after the toilet but that whole thing's relatively communal so you don't bring in your own uh, stick and sponge and obviously if you're groping around in the dark and somebody's left it the wrong way up you can imagine getting the wrong end of the stick would would stay with you probably for a quite a long time. Yeah, oh, gross. I love the idea that it's a communal stick as well. <laughs> communal toilets, yeah, this is one we'll get into. I mean, the whole privacy communal thing is a huge, huge shift, really, in just, you know, quite a recent few decades. Just imagine turning around to the guy next to you going, hey, do you want to use my stick? It's just, ah. <laughs> we, yeah, it's, you, you, you think that's a joke, but when we get there, you'll be surprised what people would do in a communal loom, actually, yeah. I can't oh, stop oh. laughing. I'm sorry, I've sat myself. On you the oh, whole time. Oh, I'm just sitting here and laughing because just the, the imagery of groping around in the dark for the wrong stick, grabbing the wrong end. Sorry. It, it's not yet been done on period drama. One of my great aims is to get a lot of period drama thoroughly smeared with filth because there's a lot missing from, you know, we believe in authenticity now to the nth degree, but it it has not got quite as authentic as, as the real stuff. Yes. <laughs> Can you imagine being in the pitch for that in the mood, sort of in the historians like, well, here's the we've got the toilet scene set up. But do you have your shitty stick standing by? <laughs> yeah, quite. Yeah. So, um, so moving on from the shitty stick, talk us through. Uh, actually, talk us through this, and then I'm going to add a comma right at the end of this one. But taking the piss, this is one of my favourite ones. That that one, I that's that's one I kind of got indirectly from how useful um, both urine and excrement were, you know, that what we've forgotten now is that no one would throw away urine in a chamber pot in a stately home during hunting season. Um, You would take it and you would stick their lovely red, but now filthy from all the mud spattered hunting chase in the chamber pot. This was the very best way to get stains out was urine. It was used to clean hands since way back in the renaissance uh, and yeah it was it was industrial stuff and there's a claim that in Saltaire, which i used to visit in um yorkshire when i was at leeds there's a claim that big industrial character there uh titus somebody was using urine habitually so that no workers in his factories were allowed to urinate except into an industrial vat uh, basically, and he particularly was keen on the urine of red-headed women. I mean, whether this is another myth about red-headed people, I don't know. But there's no question that, you know, if you're at the sharp end of cleaning, you were convinced, as somebody very practical, that urine did the job. So you would take the piss and you would not waste it. Um, and, yeah, we might get a chance to see, if we have time, how this applied to excrement 
uh, whether it's human excrement or dog excrement, but there was a whole industry of people collecting excrement off the streets of London. I mean, the old where they would virtually fight for it um, to, to get this scraped up. And it was sold by, you know, so many shillings, the, the basket throughout the Victorian period. I've got to say, I love taking the piss because it, what it does is that language actually evolves and it moves on to things like, are you having a laugh? Which pretty much means exactly the same thing, which then in Cockney mo- moves on to, are you having a bubble? Are you having a bubble bath laugh? And I keep trying to explain right, yeah. to Americans yeah. how this all <laughs> works. And it's, yeah, yeah, it doesn't yeah. go over well. Yeah, it's weirdly been cleaned up, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, bath. Well. Ginger, I can confirm. Another nice one um, before we get into the sort of disgusting meat of it, I liked was um, fat slob or slob. You know, both of these are kind of insults of uh, disgusting character. And slob actually comes from Scandinavian word for mud, but it's not just mud, it's the mud at the shoreline. This captures very well this kind of sense of, of in between things. One of the disgusting qualities I think that we instinctively find is something that's formless in between liminal so you've got not just mud which is formless sticky gets on you you can't get it off you've got the mud at the shoreline that zone of you know where one thing turns into another one of my favorites for the fat slob was uh ronnie cray during the trial for murder um big big event black market tickets going for five pounds in 1969 um and he suddenly jumps up and shouts at the prosecuting qc you fat slob what has that got to do with this case the um, judge, Melford Stevenson, later remarked that the Crays only told the truth twice uh, during this trial, and that was one of them. <laughs> That's quite impressive. Talking of Scandinavian, I feel there might be a link in this one, but troll, um, trolling, trolling. I always say trolling. Yeah, that's, that's an obvious link. And yet the fascinating thing about this is that Nobody knew what a troll was in the 1990s. You look back at the data and people talk about trolling and we're going to go trolling the Internet. And it's either kind of exciting, sort of romantic, uh, thrilling, or it's quite neutral. And it actually comes as a verb from trawling, as in fishing. So it's this sense of the Internet. You know, you've got this great vast ocean. People surf it. Uh, it's infinite. You'll never get to the bottom or you'll never get to the end of it. It's got some murky depths, as we'll see. But, yeah, the, you, you had trolling you did not have trolls there were no trolls and then about 2010 2012 uh, you start to get cyber stalking you start to get prosecutions Keir Starmer was actually involved in this as DPP and you then get the troll and it's often glossed in inverted commas so just about 10 years ago you still have to explain who this person is and they're becoming slowly disgusting Uh, but actually the whole thing is mutated from trolling fishing you know plumbing the depths to uh, a troll in the sense of this kind of underground scandinavian monster but in both cases i think you've got this this kind of sense of the depths you know whether it's the depths of the ocean uh whether it's the depths of uh, some you know horrible scandinavian monsters cave uh so yeah there's a a sense of the history of pollution of the internet getting dirtier, if you like, getting to be a you know a breeding ground for disgusting habits, I suppose. All right. I love how we started with shit and we're going to end with shit. It's not impossible, I have to admit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <Seven>. talk, <laughs> talk, talk us through in deep shit. Ah, yeah. Can we save that one for toilets? Because that actually comes with its own story. And of it's... Course. Uh, it, it's yeah it's it's probably if we slowly get through levels of disgust and get to something that disgusting we'll kind of harden ourselves until we get to the french prison where that occurs so you can let that sort of fester in your mind for a, a few moments but yeah it really happened apparently you're um, using uh, interesting words here of fester and harden that yeah. um <laughs> sorry yeah it's feel- what it is it is everywhere more and more i think the language of disgust you know it is it is i'm actually overthinking this in our culture every time you say something i'm really overthinking i'm like oh that's that is that, is that being said on purpose are you saying that in a certain way just to you know butter us up and oh, love butter us up god using the words wrong r- r- wrong words now but um yeah anyway let's uh well let's kick off with the questions because i want to know more about uh deep shit not literally so talk to us about what is discussed and when did it actually become a thing 
Yeah, so in terms of the modern kind of picture now, we've got a situation where if you were to take children, and they've done this experiment, you get them to eat um, fake feces, which is made out of peanut butter uh, and very smelly cheese. You get them to eat a whole sterilized grasshopper. Uh, up to the age of uh, about three or four, they all think, yeah, this is fine, they'll do it. You get them exposed to um, smells that are made out of chemicals, but actually, again, smell like excrement, um, smell like vomit, perhaps. And up to about three or four, they just say, yeah, that's pleasant, that's pleasant, that's pleasant. And this, uh, this is captured, I think, best of all by a friend of mine, who's a mother of three, and remembered when her oldest child had just been very, very sick, was constantly throwing up, and finally seemed to be better, cautiously ate a small meal, realized she wasn't better, threw up the whole thing. And then the baby in the family, or one of the babies, raced across the floor, grabbed hold of a, a recently vomited bit of potato and woofed it down with great gusto and, uh, uh, and pleasure. And the point about all this, and many parents will tell you stories that they wouldn't tell you easily, but once you get onto this subject, they say, well, actually, yeah, my kids, before they were four years old. So that the picture is that children have almost no sense of disgust until they're about four or five. Then you do those experiments again at five, they say, oh yeah, these smells are pleasant, these are not pleasant. So what's really happening here is that we're seeing disgust as a marker of yourself. You know, any parent will know, this is the toddler tantrum time, this is when they won't do this, this is who they are, they don't like this. And what you push away from you, what you don't like, uh, what you abhor is part of yourself, of course. So, yeah, it comes in stages, how much it's switched on, how much it's learned, how much it's taught. I mean, they say that very young children, if you make a disgusted face, as you were doing earlier, uh, they just don't recognize it. They think it's an angry face. They, they, they can't compute something that nice. Because I, one argument for this is that children, if they were too easily disgusted too early on, they would shut out a lot of things that they need to be exposed to, partly perhaps for the immune system. Uh, which is a big subject now that children are getting so much more uh, allergic to things and suffering from immune diseases. So yeah, you get your disgust in stages, it looks like, up to about the age of seven, eight. Uh, and then the picture when you're an adult is interesting. Women are much more easily disgusted than men. Um, they feel it more often and more intensely than men. Um, mothers are less disgusted than non-mothers. Uh, childless women are perhaps the most easily disgusted of, of all. And then there's, um, there you go, and then there's uh, conditions uh, and kind of states whereby it said that obese people have a, a lower disgust threshold than people of average weight. And people who have a very high discretion, uh, very, very low, dis um, sorry, people who are very easily disgusted are more likely to be, and we'll meet the uh, great man of the moment, Donald Trump, in a little while here, are more likely to be racist, xenophobic, uh, judgmental. And the same goes for people with OCD, which Trump is said to be badly afflicted with. And I think at this very moment where you know, we're looking at the whole kind of fallout from the Trump era and his biggest, most notorious thing perhaps was building a wall. Here's a wall, you know, it's something very plain, very simple to get through to all the racist thickos. Um, we've got an actual wall. And what he's doing here, he's also building a wall around himself because Trump's highly easily prone to disgust, uh, whilst at the same time being highly disgusting to perhaps about half of, of Americans. So, yeah, here with Britain, we've got Brexit, of course, we're in the fall of it, fall out of it for six years now. And it's this thing about borders around yourself, about filters between you and the world um, and what you see as invading you, actually. You know, the disgust is, is, is invasive or bad smells, bad sights, etc. cetera, are, are highly invasive. So, yeah, we go back to Shakespeare and... He never used the word disgust. He had a huge vocabulary, obviously, never used the word disgust. It was just creeping into use in the 1570s from the French. And time and again, you look at it and it's used really in the sense of something bad, but not hygienic. It's used in religious polemic. It's used over and over again between Catholics and Protestants. Um, 
But yeah, it's it's very slow to get hygienic. And my sense with this was when you know the uh, early modern period, I mean, you've got James I as a king. Um, he was particularly disgusting by anybody's standards, but he loved hunting. He drank a tremendous amount. He was probably alcoholic. And so combine these two things. He's out hunting the whole day. Uh, he simply urinates in the saddle all day to save the labor of getting off his horse. Um, and if you factor this in with somebody who never changes his clothes till they wear out, gives his female courtiers head lice uh, and so on. You've got a picture of the very top of society and how filthy they can be. But you've also got nature just constantly in your face, in your nostrils, under your feet, um, hopefully not in your fingers with the wrong end of the stick. But um, nature is, is raw and is trying to kill you. And the, you know, the amount of danger, the amount of disease, the amount of things that got inside you, that, that you, know, you had tapeworms inside you, you had lice in your hair. Uh, so borders here were, were a bit more porous or a bit more shaky. Uh, and when everything was so disgusting, it was probably impossible to be disgusted in our modern sense. You probably go mad or die of a heart attack or something. So mid 18th century, suddenly you get a big shift, huge shift. I think it's what's defined British culture, especially English culture, right down to now. The mess we're in now is all about class. It's all about feeling posher than the people from you know, Poland, Romania, Hungary, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this started with the 18th century selling you the idea that however poor you were, however humble you were, you could at least afford a bar of soap. So you could be clean and decent. And this idea around 1750 was sold most of all and sold pretty oppressively, I think, actually, to women. Um, that there was nothing more disgusting than a dirty woman. People openly said this. It was said in sermons. Um, and everyone's shouting at you, your mother, your grandmother, your sister, your employers, uh, your prospective husband, that you must be clean. So slowly and surely, women clean up the act of British society, but it is a tough job. Um, you're looking at the very top of society, the Duke of Norfolk, if you know, you're interested in the ridiculous details of, of British uh, peerage. The Duke of Norfolk is the premier duke in the, the British aristocratic system you know your duke is the top of the tree duke of norfolk is the top of the dukes so take charles howard in the 18th century um he hated water he was fairly revolting even to his servants who are probably pretty hardened to uh, all sorts of things we'd find disgusting uh, fortunately he was also an appalling drunkard so the routine was this he was foully dirty until one evening he got utterly blotted uh, and incapable uh, then in a lovely kind of candlelit silvered ritual, uh, they would ring a bell, his servants would swing him onto a litter, uh, drag him out of the, or carry him out of the room, get him in the bath and soap him all over like a kind of great incapable baby because he was too drunk to resist. So here you are at the very top of the English period, peerage. Uh, the point being that men, I think, were much slower to uh, pick up the message. You hear about aristocratic women refusing ever to share a bed with their filthy husband who is giving lice to all the women at the ball uh, and so on. Then we get down with a big leap to now. Um, and I think a lot of people in Europe and in America are looking quite hard for something to be disgusted by. Talk about that a bit more later, but it's become a kind of new marker of class. And this goes for things like smoking, things like fat. Oh, absolutely. But moving on to the ultimate form of disgust, we've all you've all drunk too much tea, got on the train, and we're halfway home. We suddenly think, oh, I'm going to be caught short. And I'm going to use Southeastern as an example because they were the ones I was using. You nip into the toilet and it's like, oh my God, that is horrific. But why have we got this notion of disgusting toilets and how bad, how far back does it go? Yeah, uh, the global variations are absolutely amazing. Um, I've been reading uh, the book, uh, Real Stories About Fake Animals by Pat Spain, which is terrific fun. His books are out this December. And as someone who travels to uh, Mongolia, deepest Africa and so forth, you know, he gets exposed to a lot of very different habits around toilets. So one African tribe's absolutely bemused by the fact that the Americans like to do their business in private. You know, this is just weird. Um, and one of the big learning curves is getting used to a lot of sniggering children around you watching you use the loo when your sort of rudimentary toilet falls down one day. Um, he, he recalls the shared toilet seat where there's one 
toilet seat for five different loos and you pick it up and put it back. Um, and yeah, the, the one that really stuck with me was Tibet. Uh, this was current into the 1930s. And how serious are you about ecology? Well, the Tibetans, as I said, you know, you didn't waste urine, you didn't waste excrement in uh, Victorian or Edwardian uh, Britain. And the Tibetans did not waste anything in the sense that your toilet habitually in a lot of places was this. You went to a kind of open hole, perhaps 12, 20 foot over the pigsty. And that was your toilet. You know, the, the, this was this was how the pigs got fed. You did not waste anything at all. Um, cut, cutting from your southeastern experience um, and going to American drain toilets to the furthest opposite extreme, if you like. Uh, I only know this because of an American friend. But as far as I know, you get on an American train, you go into the toilet and you cannot stop this process. It's absolutely automatic each new user of the toilet gets a plastic covering, as in kind of shrink wrap, over the toilet seat, which then the moment you flush the toilet is ripped off and flushed down the toilet. And this is just one example of the relationship between disgust and ecology, that there's this very powerful seesaw effect between private disgust and public squalor, if you like, you know, all the plastic islands that are floating about and the problems of wet wipes. So, yeah, the, the big factor just hinted at, I suppose, here, first off, is that division between public and private, that there, there were simply no private toilets for almost anybody except perhaps a few aristocrats and monarchs. But to start at the very top, if you like, here, Henry VIII um, and all the monarchs down to allegedly Queen Anne, and we've seen a film about this recently, The Favourite, where they've certainly not included this detail. All of them had what was known as a groom of the stool. This was basically a role which was fought for tooth and nail um, by the most sharp elbowed, ambitious young aristocrats, usually male when it was a male monarch, uh, of the court. Uh, and yeah, you, you fought ferociously to get the position in which, as far as we know, they're not too keen to talk about this directly, but you wiped the king's ass. Um, you expect, inspected his excrement because obviously the state of the king's health was, was crucial. Uh, and this, this possibly went right down to, to Queen Anne uh, with this favourite that we've, we've seen on film. If you go down a bit further, you would expect aristocrats to have their own private toilets. Uh, but there's an interesting scenario going on at Knoll, the, the stately home in 1736. The Duchess of Richmond was known to be asking her husband to have her toilet altered. She had a two-seater toilet, which would mean that she and her friend, she and her husband, whoever it would be, would sit there together in the mornings having a chat, perhaps. Uh, the reason she wanted the toilet altered was not because it was uh, too public, but because it wasn't sufficiently communal. So she asked for a three-seater toilet so that when she had two friends to visit, uh, they could all sit there happily chatting. And what's extraordinary to us, I think, now is that over and over again, monarchs, aristocrats, letting you come into the loo, or you know, effectively sitting on a stool, as it were, um, while they're defecating is a mark of privilege, is a mark of honor. You are the chosen elite to be allowed in there to sit and entertain them um, while they defecate. So this is the situation right at the top. Everywhere else, the, the question is not just, are there any public toilets? It's, are there any toilets at all? Uh, so that Casanova, uh, going through London in the 1750s, was staggered to find habitually Londoners defecating in the streets of London. You just walk along, see this wherever you went. And he noticed particularly that people uh, had their bums towards him and their backs towards him, uh, which he wasn't too keen on, but which was a minimal way of preserving their privacy in this situation. Uh, a, a lecture of mine from A-Level from the um, time I studied in the early 90s, Mike Strange had written a great memoir of his childhood called War Baby. Uh, and in this, he was evacuated from Sussex to Wales uh, in about 42, and he was in a very remote Welsh village called Pump Saint, 
and they had a chamber pot for urinating in the night in this one up one down cottage and then in the morning the ritual for defecation was this there was a very fast flowing river in the middle of the village there was a bridge across the river there was an extra plank uh, attached to the bridge with holes cut in it and everybody sat there every morning over the holes chatting away heartily uh, in in communal defecation so then you get to the question of public toilets, the, the whole business of spending a penny, as it was known in the Victorian era, was extraordinary in Britain and in America. The very first flushing toilets were at the Great Exhibition in 1851. A tremendous number of people used them as a novelty so that a couple of companies opened up male and female public toilets in London expecting to make a great deal of money. So, you know, people walking across London, tremendous distances, um, particularly women couldn't urinate. And these public toilets simply closed down in a matter of weeks because everyone was too embarrassed to use them. And from the mid 19th century through to the early 20th century, American doctors, civic hygiene campaigners are all saying the same thing. The towns are disgusting, they stink. Um, women are being offended by the smell of urine everywhere. They're being offended by men standing around urinating. They themselves can't urinate uh, and are in dreadful agony until they get back home. But everybody is simply too embarrassed to tolerate the idea of actual permanent, conspicuous, labelled public lose. So it, it takes a very long time for kind of one form of disgust to battle against the other and for the for the, you know, the taken for granted public loo to come into place. I just want to confirm that, yes, that is what the Americans do. I have uh, recently just come back from the States, but they also do Thank other you. various, yeah. uh, they do other things as well. So, for example, mm. some of the loos, kind, I don't know how to describe this, they um, kind of disinfect themselves. Yeah. Or they have a paper version of a, of a loo cover. There's so many different ways. And not yeah. all the loos do this. So it's like, I probably, I don't know, somebody in America is going to so tell me I'll, that, that I'm wrong. But the ones that I've been to, let's say about 70% of them are mm. quite, you know, self-cleaning and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, yeah. I, th I think my, my hunch has been that certain Americans are the most easily disgusted people in, in the world pretty much now. And that's, I think the thing interesting here is of course you've got chicken and egg, you've got, okay, people will get disgusted if you don't have a toilet seat and a cleaning procedure like that. But once you've got those procedures, they shift your threshold of disgust, you know, so that things that are not like that once you come to Europe or, and I think what I was struck by, I think all of us have been disorientated by uh, different toilet habits across the world. Um, Erica Jong, uh, the, the famous female author talked about the fact that in, in um, Germany, and I'll just be a bit plain and crude here, there aren't really any neutral language, uh, neutral terms for all this, um, but the Germans have what's become known as a shit shelf. That there's actually a deliberate kind of flat shelf in the toilet so that they can inspect their excrement before it gets flushed away. And Jong did remark that a nation, you know, when you go to a toilet that's a squat toilet, that it has no seat, um, you go to a toilet that has no lock on the door, you go to Greece and there's simply no flushing system, the, the plumbing can't take paper, so you have a bin. Famously in um, My Family and Other Animals, Gerald Durrell's sister mistook the whole system and thought that the bin full of used toilet paper was a bin kindly placed there for toilet paper for first use, uh, and then spent the rest of the day disinfecting herself in a state of hysteria when she, she learned the truth. Um, yeah, there's a kind of silent language uh, that's communicating to you or not communicating to you. And I think is often actually harder than problems of language uh, across, across cultures. Um, but people were very hard headed, were very difficult to discuss. So we've talked about cleaning things with urine. We've talked about people fighting for excrement all across London. They were called pure finders. And the irony is that when you were a fine lady or gentleman admiring your books, admiring your gloves, all the leather that you had was soaked and softened in, in excrement. 
This was absolutely standard procedure. That's why it's all being collected. The other one that I loved was um, churches. So think of how many times you've seen a fine congregation, ladies and gentlemen, in a church in a period drama. What you do not see or crucially hear, and of course will never smell yet anyway, um, is all the fine ladies with very full voluminous skirts urinating in their seats because the, the sermons go on and on and on. Um, <laughs> they're hugely long, but they're also hugely fashionable. So there was a Jesuit preacher in France um, where obviously you're talking very aristocratic period in the 1670s before the revolution. And this guy was called Louis Bourdaloo. Uh, he had the dubious honor of giving his name to source boats that were taken by women held under their skirts and used to urinate in during the interminable but very fashionable sermons uh, of Mr. Bourdaloo. And these became known as Bourdaloos. Have you got your Bourdaloo? You know, ask your servant, have you packed the Bourdaloo? Um, so, yeah, perhaps he was very handsome as well. I don't know. But um, the churches were so full of urine, they were actually saturated with it on the floor that People who wanted saltpeter, which, as you might know, is uh, an ingredient in gunpowder, so was was quite valuable, asked if they could dig up the floors of churches because urine uh, helped to produce this. How hard headed, how uh, you know, difficult to discuss with people and how much did they feel like get nature on their side, whether it was excrement, whether it was urine. The original Indiana Jones, Roy Chapman Andrews, has lots of disgusting scenarios in his wonderful autobiography, Under a Lucky Star. I recommend it if you haven't read it. It's tremendous fun. And one thing he talks about in China is walking along with great columns of uh, mules for merchants caravans every single mule has a little basket under its bum you know this tremendous market in um mule excrement for manure and then we cut back to europe and uh, a french magistrate cotu in the early 19th century i think it was in rheim in uh france was making humane visits to prisons to see how the prisons were getting on and prisons were unimaginably harsh in these times you got, I think, no food unless your relatives brought it in. And it was freezing cold in the winter. So Potsu came into this dark prison. It absolutely stank, but he also couldn't work out what he was looking at. He had a kind of just stout sort of shift and he reeled back and he seemed to be looking at a woman's head perched on a dung heap. He then presently realized as he got closer that it was so cold that the female prisoner he was looking at was simply inside a mound of her own excrement to keep warm. Nice. I mean, I can understand it, but... <laughs> so that perhaps brings us on to disgust in class. I don't know, that might be a good point to uh, jump from the bottom of the heap to the, uh, the top. You'd imagine that, that there would be quite a difference between in class, but I mean, in levels of disgust. Yeah, I think, again, what's interesting is it all happened in the 18th century. It would have been much harder to separate people off in this way, um, whether it was king, peasantry, whatever, in the time of Shakespeare, Charles II. Early 18th century, things were a lot rougher, really. But yeah, Keith Thomas has done tremendous work on this, History of Civility. And it's through the 18th century that people start demanding their own, um, their own separate vessels for drinking. But you've got people really just, you know, drinking from one communal cup a lot of the time you've got people just putting their fingers into a pie or a joint uh, on a table communally then they start to use forks um, they start to use handkerchiefs instead of wiping their noses on their sleeves so all these little habits start to add up and they become a kind of you know code unwritten language that you should know if you're a gentleman or a gentlewoman but as noted this this really was pushed by women first and um yeah, someone like Top and Beauclair was, if you looked at him on a period drama, um, he died, I think, 1770. He would look like the, you know, the perfect dandy. He was a great book collector. He was a great wit. He was a friend of Dr. Johnson. Um, he had a beautiful library designed by Adam for all his vast book collection. Uh, and yeah, he was absolutely filthy. I mean, his own friends, Walpole and co, you know, said he was more filthy in his habits than any beggar or gypsy. Um, and yeah, Lady Diana Spencer, one of the early ones, refused to ever share a bed with him. Uh, and he would he would give lice to, to any women around him. Then you get into the 19th century and you get 
kind of more of the same, if you like, and it becomes heavily politicized. So an etymology actually, which we didn't bring in, but we can bring in now, is the great unwashed. You know, almost everybody's heard this phrase, uh, whether they've used it or not, you hear it, uh, and it's almost proverbial, but it was actually patented in 1830 by an amazing character, Edward bulwer Lytton. And bulwer Lytton is almost completely forgotten now, but he was absolutely everywhere in the 19th century. He was the best-selling author until Dickens took over. He was a great friend of Dickens. Um, he, he, he made massive amounts of money out of his novels. He wrote a tremendous amount. Uh, he gave us the phrases, it's a dark and stormy night, and the pen is mightier than the sword. And he gave us the phrase, the great unwashed. It had been used a few times, just a handful, um, before he put it into uh, a novel. So in the preface to one of his novels, he, he writes about a character called Pelham, um, that he bathes and lives cleanly, um, two habits that are held, held against him by Messrs the Great Unwashed. So what happens here crucially is that Lytton associates that phrase in opposition to one of the great dandies of fiction. Uh, he's somebody who's associated with evening dress, which actually Bulwer Lytton seems to have invented for men. Uh, and so you've got this aspirational figure. He's a dandy, he's a wit, he's stylish, uh, he's aristocratic, and he's opposing himself to the great unwashed. And for the next several decades through Britain and later on in America, anybody who got into a meeting for reform to ask for political justice, better wages, uh, the vote, it really all come back to us now. Um, almost all of that is at stake um, in in modern Britain, um, but at a time when, you know, very few men had the vote and the vote for women wasn't even dreamed of, you got into a reform meeting and the right wing press hurled at you over and over again, you stank, you were the great unwashed, you were dirty. Uh, and this was a brilliant kind of weapon whereby you didn't need to actually argue and there were no real arguments. How can you give someone, uh, how can you make someone pay tax and not allow them to vote? Uh, so you just throw this visceral weapon that surpasses all argument, hits people in the guts, hits them in the nostrils, they stink, reform stinks. The left wing, uh, the working classes, they're dirty. They're the great unwashed. And this was used again by the Republicans against the Democrats right down to about 1911. Um, and then brilliantly, when you thought it had all gone away, although I had a friend who went to Bath Abbey a few years ago, and when the nice clean um, uh, assistant of the Abbey came out to do the tour for the, the Hoi Polloi, remarked not really under his breath, oh, it's my turn to deal with the great unwashed. This was a few years ago. Uh, but the time when this really came back was after Dominic Cummings had made his lockdown busting trip up to Durham. And one of the Durham police remarked, yeah, they can do what they like. The rest of us are just the great unwashed. Yeah. So it, it, it came back with a little coda um, in interesting circumstances. I'm not guilty of using that phrase ever. Me neither. Me neither. I didn't think I'd hear it again in, in a hurry. But yeah, yeah. I may have used it to describe my boys. <laughs> Actually, yeah. One of my friends does refer to her, her, her male child is the only one of three as the folk dodger. Yeah. <laughs> I may be guilty of using it as an excuse to not use public transport. Yeah, yeah, I mean, who needs an excuse? You know, the whole idea of strikes ruining our Christmas. Rail services ruin your Christmas every year. There's, there's no trains, there's just buses, you know. Uh, it's, and yeah, to lose work at all, you're lucky. But um, yeah, I think, you know, what we're saying about these automatically cleaning loos on American trains is a real symptom of American disgust and looking for something to be disgusted by. I mean, for most of history, you were trying not to look at disgusting things because they were everywhere. They were under your feet. They were in your face. They were in your nostrils. They were in your bloody body, you know, um, lice, worms. You'd be as healthy as you liked and you couldn't stop tapeworms eating your food. Um, and now people are looking for things and smoking is a huge one, absolutely huge. Um, the other one that I think is fascinating is wet wipes, because here you've got this thing where wet wipes start off as a bit of an optional thing for kids and, you know, cleaning them up when there's no water. OK, then they become the de rigueur standard use instead of toilet paper for kids up to what age. I don't really know. Um, 
And then they become the standard toilet paper for adults and particularly for celebrities. And you have big profile American actors abusing their dates when they go in their loo and find out they don't have any wet wipes in there. Uh, this is one of those economies of disgust where are we disgusted at the actor who is disgusted at the woman? Um, or are we going to be more disgusted at the result of all this? Because there's this fascinating seesaw between private disgust, private hygiene and general squalor. And it takes a monstrous, horrific and very modern form. This is the fatberg. Uh, several times now in the last, I think, maybe 20 years in America, in Britain, vast, monstrous, double-decker bus-sized um, things of fat welded together in sewers have threatened to actually explode the entire sewer back up into people's homes. I mean, see this as a parable of the return of the disgusting repressed. But what is particularly glorious about this is, according to sewer workers, who are vastly more disgusted by fat than anything else that goes down a sewer, meaning this literally, sewer workers will tell you that fatbergs are stitched together by wet wipes. Uh, so yeah. yeah, they keep campaigning with these, you know, very dubious uh, marketing things that these are flushable and all the rest of it. The water companies tell you, no, they are not. Do not ever flush these things down the toilet. Uh, the other big one in the 70s and onwards, um, or probably before that, was aerosol deodorants. And of course, there's huge pressure on women, especially. Do you know that you smell and you don't notice it? Uh, so you want this lovely, clean, modern aerosol deodorant. You can be confident, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, this is eating the sky. Uh, this is the start of all the CFC problems, which it, it took a long time to to get under control a, a very recent one and one that really took me by surprise when you think again about how hard it was to discuss to people for most of history there is now something known to marketing folk uh, in terms of supermarkets called product contagion now contagion traditionally is a huge factor in disgust obviously and sometimes it's actually real contagion but product contagion is this with all your shiny box shrink wrap etc etc dustless shelves of products if you put nappies next to biscuits you will sell less of those biscuits these guys are paid to study this stuff they're paid for the nuts and bolts and they're absolutely sure about this if you put athletes foot cream cigarettes next to some tasty food you will sell less of the tasty food so something in people's heads you know with no kind of visceral logic at all uh, is contaminating these these nice yummy biscuits yeah there is that, that whole thing about supermarkets and product placement for, for that just re reason it's um apparently it's quite in-depth science yeah i had no idea but it seems you know you get whole professors of uh of contaminated biscuits nowadays yeah <laughs> got to do your degree in something i guess but which moves us on in a way to a way to germophobia and how would you I, I love the idea that his germophobia was just so terrified he was so terrified of it all but how, how did it affect his life yeah well this starts for me with Howard Hughes's death my, my earliest traumatic memory I would say is this of the TV news it was April 1976 so I was actually not quite seven I was pretty young but this really sticks in my head I can see it now there's a man being stretchered across an airport runway and he looked like nothing I had ever seen he did not look human you could not work out, was he alive? Was he dead? This was Howard Hughes. I had no idea who he was. I had no idea what germophobia was, uh, but Hughes, uh, something between six foot two and six foot four, I think he'd actually shrunk a little bit by this time, um, weighed, I think, 90 pounds at this stage. So this was a man who had killed himself through his terror of germs. You look at the broad sweep of history, thousands perhaps millions of people died because they didn't know what germs were and Hughes died because he did or he thought he did and yeah this this man was let's remind ourselves uh, a billionaire before almost anybody knew what billionaires were or knew that billionaires existed he was a figure of incredible glamour in film in aviation in commerce uh, and yet slowly from the 1950s, so we're looking at a very, very long, slow decline to that scene on the, the airfield, 
uh, he became paranoid about germs. I suppose it's that kind of scenario we've got going on a bit now with billionaires and they want plasma donations, they want all this research to allow them to live forever. So Hughes had everything, but he was still mortal and he became absolutely obsessed with the opening of his cupboards, his cans of food, his food preparation. There were 15 steps in his can memo, uh, capital C, capital M, to open a can, uh, a sterile fork, a sterile plate, vast numbers of Kleenex needed to be used. So another little kind of nod towards, you know, the problems of ecology and disgust uh, to do anything for him. His windows were sealed up with tape. Um, he had a, a strange kind of ritual with newspapers where he had to be bought three newspapers every morning and he would pull out the middle one as the, the least contaminated. Um, and Hughes suffered obviously from OCD, from obsessive compulsive disorder, which extraordinary thing, you, you get stories from Judith Rappaport's book about this, of somebody who, he, he couldn't stand living in his apartment. His cleaning complex with the apartment was so bad, he was late to work all the time, he was gonna get fired. So he moves into a motel um, and then he gets thrown out of the motel for, and this is quite literal, being in the shower for 10 hours. Wow. Uh, the, you know, understandably, the, the motel owner just turns the water off. You, you can't have this for every guest. Uh, so then he, he moves out and sleeps on park benches. Um, and Rappaport says, well, wasn't it worse? You know, you can't control things. You can't really clean up on a park bench. He's saying, no, no, it's things that I was responsible for. It was my things. When it's not my things, it's better. Now, I give this parable of the hotel for one reason. In 1966, uh, Hughes was living with his entourage in a Las Vegas hotel. New Year was about to come up. It was about this time of year, I guess. And the hotel management's got a big New Year bunch coming in, tries to throw Hughes out. Hughes' response to this is simple and exactly what any good billionaire would do. He buys the hotel, uh, so they cannot throw him out. So here you're looking at this awful parable of affluence, that he's a victim of his own affluence. If you're that guy in the motel, you might need to go for help in the end, and you might go to a therapist. If you're huge, you're beyond all help. Nobody can touch you. Um, so he gets further and further into this spiral of kind of paradoxical disgust because his standards of germophobia become so high, he gives up wearing clothes, he goes around naked, uh, with shaggy hair and overgrown nails. Um, he urinates in cartons. He simply kicks a door each time he wants someone to open it because he daren't touch the door handle. Uh, and finally, we get to that scenario, which I saw and still remember now, uh, when I was just less than seven on the, on the airstrip, where he'd, he'd basically malnourished himself to, to, to death, down to 90 pounds. Just as soon as we started talking about it, I suddenly remember the parody in the simpsons of um mr burns in one of the episodes where he goes a bit howard hughes and he's like get in the plane smithers it's only a model sir get in the plane and he's all shaggy hair and long nails yeah yeah i mean you you see a bit of it on the film the aviator don't you um toward the end and it's it's pretty grim to look at um, but yeah, I think, you know, reading all this, you finally concluded H Howard Hughes was perhaps the most expensively miserable man who ever lived until Donald Trump. And Donald Trump has had the peculiar uh, privilege amongst American presidents of being the most disgusted and the most disgusting president in American history. Uh, I might come back for, for, for beauty in fact, because talking about Trump is brings us quite neatly onto this one, which is one of my favourite things in the world, other than Alina, is the vast lexicon of information that is the internet. But whereas it can give us some great information, there's a lot to be discussed on there, isn't there? Which Yeah, this, this, this did take me by surprise. I, I thought I knew what an internet troll was. Um, and then I learned the whole kind of thing about this monster having kind of sort of evolved out of this sort of harmless fishing but but yeah trolls um when they started becoming the object of cyber stalking campaigns you've got center for cyber stalking research university of bedfordshire you've got i think 50 53,000 complaints of online harassment around 2012 about a thousand prosecutions starmer didn't really know what he was looking at this was interesting that when you see his comments in the press about these trolls these are people these are usually kids 
um, who are going to great length to get attention online by ridiculing and abusing the families of people who've died, sometimes of suicide, sometimes of accident. And the people who've died are often children, teenagers. So it's about the most tragic kind of thing you can imagine. Uh, and these people just for fun are, yeah, trying to get, you know, attention online and can get it very fast globally in sort of, you know, clear statistics. And I'm looking at this and thinking, so did the internet invent this? You know, is the internet responsible for this? And I went back to the history of the poison pen letter. And this is pretty mind bending as well. It's a hundred years ago in 1922 that the terror of Tull, as in Tull Lace, T-U-L-L-E in France, um, had been terrorizing uh, that town for three years. Uh, and this was purely poison pen letters. People had gone mad. People had killed themselves uh, as a result of all these secrets that were somehow wormed out. And of course, wormed out, what's interesting, was a tremendous lot of effort. Um, you know, it's very easy to get a lot of information about people now just from their social media. But this had to be got from gossiping, from eavesdropping. I don't know entirely how it was all got. But yeah, finally, these um, two terrors of Tal, it turned out to be two, uh, who were constantly referred to as demented men, actually turned out to be a mother and daughter team. Uh, and were, were prosecuted. And interestingly, as with the troll, who seemed to be this anonymous, cowardly, socially dysfunctional kind of loner, you know, lurking in their mother's basement, whatever it might be, um, too afraid to actually abuse anybody to their face. Um, one of the team, I think it was the daughter, actually killed herself because she couldn't stand facing up to people in, in court. So we've come a long way in about 90 years uh, since that. But the strange thing is that which way does the disgust fly? Which way does it sit? You know, it's it's a huge weapon on the internet. So Trump is constantly calling people disgusting. Uh, people are constantly calling him disgusting. The language of disgust, rancid, putrid, uh, beyond disgusting. I'm going to throw, I'm going to hurl, that's sick, uh, and so forth, is, is a big, big factor in politics and kind of things about celebrity. Um, but then you've also got people who do deliberately disgusting things to get attention, the whole TikTok challenge. Um, I probably haven't gone far enough into this or perhaps I've gone as far as I dare, but you know, eating out of toilets um, and the fastest way to get attention in a very saturated attention seeking market seems to be to do uh, disgusting things. There's precedence for this on TV as we'll perhaps, perhaps see. But beyond that, actually, I think in a way, the biggest kind of scandal you might say about the internet is actually a growing kind of self-disgust, a digital detox. You know, think about the language there, toxic, poison. Again, it's the language that gets used in terms of hurling about disgust as a weapon. But these people feel they need to detox themselves. Uh, you've got holidays where grown adults sign away their telephone and they will not get it back for the whole holiday because this is the only way they can leave their work emails and so forth alone to actually have a real holiday. When I rang somebody up in, in desperation for a plumber the other day, he answered me and said, sorry, I'm in Mexico. Well, you know, you don't need to answer your phone, you're on holiday. Um, but yeah, the I think the big sort of simmering silent scandal here is that in the history of disgust, one of the big, big disgusting things is addiction. So drugs, um, smoking, you know, heavy stuff like heroin, um, the can be a, a sense of addiction to food in, in some kind of eating disorders, obviously, so that feeds into um, disgust about fat and obesity. Uh, but in fact, what we've got at the moment is a clean, shiny, high-tech, modern dot-com addiction, which is bigger than anything I think that's ever happened in history. I think the only rival would be smoking. Um, I think in 1948, 82% of British men smoked. That was the peak. But how many people now from the age of maybe eight, uh, you know, you're seeing kids with phones coming home from school, um, how many people are addicted to the internet? And what is the longest period of time that they do not check uh, their emails, their social media? You know, are they able to watch a whole film without, without checking this? So yeah, when you, you turn it on its head like that and you realize that people are, I think, self-disgusted, then addiction is, 
this is the newest one for sure and it's perhaps the biggest one ever you hear stories that you know there are more people in the world with access to the internet than access to clean water so add it up um the look on mine and chris's face right now while you were saying that we're not both so guilty of all of that completely i think it's affected everybody it's affected almost everybody except you know little kids really i don't know my 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 kids are fairly addicted to youtube the youngest is eight yeah yeah i mean i get you know we were addicted to tv probably weren't we as kids i mean i i certainly was there wasn't much of it you know addicted to as much as you had um but yeah this is the new version isn't it it's it's very different well, we, we've touched on it briefly, but um, should we go through smoking? Because, I mean, I, I grew up in the 1980s and smoking was, yeah. I mean, not for me, I was too small, but, uh, you know, smoking was everywhere. But now yeah. it's, it's good. Yeah, it's, it's yeah you and I share very similar memories, I guess, you know, of, of Britain in the 80s. Um, I mean, the, the long term history of this is absolutely extraordinary. I, you, you've got the big divide, I suppose, first of all, is that once you get, um, smoking mass produced. So you move from pipes to cigarettes and it becomes affordable for the working classes. You know, everybody is smoking, uh, but women are the ones demonized most of all. And you, you hear stories of uh, a woman working, walking her children through Regent's Park in say 1890. And she suddenly comes across something where you get an absolutely authentic, 100% disgust face. You know, she, she reels away, she covers the children's faces uh, and she hastens out to complain to a park warden that they must prosecute this disgusting woman. There's a woman smoking, simply this. And smoking women were, yeah, were disgusting. They were linked with um, free thinking, radicalism, uh, suffragettes, uh, the modern woman in general. And then you leap over the ponds to America and a wonderful scenario they should do on film someday. I don't think they have, uh, but in the Grand Old Plaza Hotel, and I think it was 1907. So kind of heyday of, you know, um, Edwardian glamour. Uh, a woman is lighting up a cigarette in the Grand Palm Court of the, of the plaza and a poor servant very sort of nervously, but, um, inevitably hastens over to tell her women cannot smoke in the hotel. Now, this woman is none other than Mrs. Patrick Campbell, uh, as in Shaw's Pygmalion, big, big independent woman, very strong woman, husband dies, she supports herself as an actress. And this ignites a whole American furore about women smoking. You get a lovely thing in Martin's Cafe, which was, I think, a very glitzy cafe, where for New Year's, he says, yeah, we're going to allow ladies to smoke, but only ladies, not women. So back comes class, even in America here. Next, you've got a guy called Sullivan, um, an alderman, I think, in um, the early 20th century, proposing what's become known as the Sullivan Ordinance, is that women cannot smoke anywhere in public under pain of fines and possibly imprisonment. I mean, they end up in court. This doesn't stick, but it doesn't stop them trying it. And they keep upping the fines. Uh, poor old policemen are having to haul these furious women off the street if they smoke. And it's linked to a whole sort of moral degeneracy that once mothers start smoking, they'll rob their husbands to get the money for the cigarettes. The next thing you know, they'll murder somebody to get them. Uh, and I'm pretty much quoting literally from the, the right wing press here. Um, no less extraordinary, I think, is the idea which we probably all know from Mad Men, you know, the big crisis on Mad Men, when suddenly you cannot advertise cigarettes by saying they're good for you. Suddenly yeah, you yeah. haven't got a nurse or a doctor. But that, of course, is the early 60s. And if you go back to medical news in uh, America, 1895, a doctor, Charles Montgomery, um, is asserting quite confidently that smoking prevents lung disease. Um, and, and this is a great one, that tobacco is an antiseptic and germicide of considerable power. Um, and this is repeated over and over again in a time when cholera, typhoid, and of course, the first pandemic in um, the early 20s uh, were huge killers and were, were not you know, controlled in any way. Smoking was an antiseptic. Tobacco smoke was an antiseptic. So you've got this kind of cloud of... Um, of personal protection where we now have hand sanitizer or masks they're using smoke uh, occasionally you see people saying well you know the great unwashed on trams and trains they stink so i smoke and i don't smell them um, smokers are supposed to be the best athletes uh, at this point 
But yeah, um, you've got all sorts of different economies of disgust and it takes a long time for women to be sold cigarettes. Eventually kind of commercial weight wins out and they're sold what are called beauty tips with special tips that, um, that won't smudge your lipstick in the 1950s. I think it's Marlborough that kicks this off. But um, yeah, if you, if you go back to the early days, what people have forgotten now, I think, is that women found one thing really disgusting and it was spitting. That tobacco chewers, people who chewed tobacco, were spitting all the time. I mean, you couldn't go into a cathedral in Europe without wandering amongst piles of spit. As a woman with a long skirt, you were constantly hauling your skirt up all across the uh, city because you were sweeping up spit, basically. So you've got cigarettes being clean by comparison with dirty spitting tobacco chewers. And yeah, it's... Uh, it kind of slowly cleans itself up until you get down to what, I don't know, the last 20, 30 years. It seems to be getting stronger all the time. And now you've got, you know, people in America will go up to a complete stranger in uh, some public place. I mean, this has stopped to a large extent, because you're not even allowed to smoke in any public places. But when you could at all, they'll go up to a complete stranger and tell them you're disgusting. And the odds are this smoker will sort of shrink away and say, yeah, yeah, I know it's revolting. I'm trying to stop. I'm trying to stop uh, rather than saying, screw you, mind your own business. And really, if you look at the whole grand economy of this, America, even with China now, you know, looming over the top, America for a very long time has been the biggest polluter of the world. And we've got a Black Lung Award for films which dare show smoking. If it's a period film, it's OK, but if it's a modern film, you know, they will be counting up the number of smoking scenes or as they call them, tobacco incidents. But where is the Black Lung Award for endless trails of SUVs on succession or private jets, you know, on celebrity reality television? So there's a very kind of weird ecology in this where smoking has become worse than heroin to, to a lot of Americans. Um, but finally, I think you looked at the whole sort of economy in wartime. What fascinated me with that um, is that you know, you're radically divided as a British and a German soldier, let's say, or a, an American and a German soldier, by massive barriers of ideology, of hatred, of death, of politics. And yet, without even sharing the word of one another's language, you can tie this guy's hands, you can walk him away, uh, you can put a gun to his head, but you can also offer him a cigarette. And we'll still see this on films. You know, they do get this right, I think, on period drama. And without a word spoken, you've established a kind of strange bond, actually. And of course, in wartime, when, you know, everything is unbelievably disgusting. You know, you're covered in fleas, rats, lice, mud, to be honest, shit in the trenches. Are you going to be disgusted about smoking? <laughs> it's about, you know, the only portable pleasure, if you can keep them dry, that that, that you've got anymore. Another nice one from Roy Chapman Andrews, the, the great original Indiana Jones, was that he said when he dissected as a medical student, he could never get through a dissection without smoking. It was the thing that kind of, you know, kept the, the smell of the corpse, which wasn't terribly well preserved then um, at bay for him. Richard, we could probably sit here for the next two hours talking about disgust. If only people could have seen mine and Chris's face, because we're not showing video, yeah, Thank we God. need some clips of that. I think, you know, I want, I want your faces on the cover of the book, really. I, and I want the audio, the audio book to have all the laughter, the very amb ambivalent laughter has got to be on the audio as well, I think. I think Definitely. some of it was uh, Chris agreeing and me going, what the heck are you two talking about? Like, Well, we might have proved the women more easily disgusted, I guess, um, as, as we go. I don't know. Oh, unmarried, as uh, not unmarried. Uh, without children. Wi women without children, exactly. I have no children, yeah. so I probably have a higher level of uh, disgust. You get, you get a crash course from what I gather. You know, mothers tell me the things they tell you, yeah. But listen, let us know, remind us the name of your book. And uh, when is, uh, is it out now? Yeah, so just the one to end on, I suppose, is I'm probably going to end up with three books. So we've talked about ecology a lot. It's got huge in the research and in the writing. And I've, I've touched on just a small amount of it now, but the, the one that I'll, I'll just, I'll leave us with is entertainment. So I think I'm gonna do a whole book on entertainment, starting with Shakespeare and the fact that theater was disgusting, the Puritans hated it. 
biggest moral panic in history was probably about something now is the high canonized, patriotic, glorious, glossy William Shakespeare was revolting. Um, but now I think it's about the last um, last 20 odd years that television has self-consciously embraced disgust as a genre. So you start with, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, take lovely, glossy, clean, godlike celebrities, make them do filthy, disgusting things. That's the core principle of the whole thing. Um, it's still running now, but you've got how clean is your house, disgusting diets. Uh, it's strong in quite recent stuff. Westworld, Billions, uh, Succession, Fleabag, and shows, I think, which frame themselves with the kind of the most disgusting opening you can imagine. You know, you get it right there at the start. It's actually there at the start of The Crown. Um, and yeah, Succession and Fleabag, I think, are kind of jostling to be the most disgusting, big hit, global TV shows. But the really triumphant thing, I think, um, is Fleabag does this with a woman. And all through history, you've had these kind of knockabout, fun and games, rough and tumble characters from Thomas Nash's uh, Jack Wilton, first ever novel, through to Tom Jones, through to Bertie Wooster, and kind of characters in Dostoevsky. But when you get a woman who's this kind of character that there's no limits, there's no filters, uh, there's no holds barred, you know, the whole thing starts with this very kind of comical, I've done all the kind of disgusted female cleaning up, depilating, et cetera, and then starts talking to you about anal sex, you know, in the very first minutes of, of the show. I mean, this is bold stuff. This is this is brave stuff to do, I think. And female comedians are starting to push this a bit now, um, are, are being quite brave with this and kind of body, body stuff that's been taboo. So, yeah, we're looking at ecology, entertainment and um, politics, which just kind of kept giving me disgusting gifts. You know, after I'd come up with the first idea, it just kept sort of spewing out revolting stuff you didn't really want to know uh and nobody's quite cleaned it all up yet uh but yeah matt hancock i guess sums it up perfectly the guy who got caught on video smooching like something out of a bad school disco uh when we're all supposed to be not contacting each other and is now pissing about thinking he's a celebrity when he's supposed to be a paid mp on on silly television um so, Sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but yeah. did you ever see that meme of him where he's in between two women's legs and it was like, uh, the best way is always to eat out? Sorry, what's the slogan? <laughs> the best way is always to eat out. Oh, wow. Oh, that's a beauty. Thank you. That'll, 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 go, that'll go right in the book. It might be the cover, actually. That if we can get the copyright done, that might be the, the cover. We'll probably demand a lot of money for it, won't he? But, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to send you that meme. That's of you. Please do. No. So the, the, the umbrella type is talking dirty, um, the history of disgust. But yeah, it's a endlessly fertile gift that keeps keeps on giving, even if you don't quite want it. <laughs> Sorry, we've lost Lena. So, but, no, um, we've, got yeah. another, we've got another possibility for the cover there. If you, you could see it, it's, it's a cover image, isn't it, in the making? But, um, but uh, thanks. Thanks very much for coming to talk to us and killing Alina's sense of humour for the night, Richard. It's been great. Th thanks for tolerating. It's been, it's been terrific fun. Thank you. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section thank you so much for your continued support we really appreciate our listeners and supporters so make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book <laughs>